trial in August 1963. He shows up, and Dr. Otto shows up, and he collapses in court during his preliminary hearing after complaining of a racing heart. Tests showed that he had suffered a heart attack. Doctor said he needed two or three days of observation. After brief delays, the hearing continued and the charges went forward. In September, a month later, Otto filed a motion asking that his trial be separated from that of Sam Saro. Um, he didn't want to be associated with him at trial. Uh, in an affidavit, Otto claimed that Saro and another man, both members of the mafia, came to his office and demanded that Otto pay $5,000 to Saro's attorney to cover the legal fees. The district attorney opposed separating them at trial, um, and the judge denied it. So they would have to be tried together. Now, again, I don't know that he was a member of the mafia. This is just what the doctor is claiming in his files here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who the other man who showed up with Saro was. I have a suspicion of who it was, but I do not know. Shortly after this, Rockford mobster Charlie Vince called Dr. Otto. We don't know what was discussed. We just know that this phone call was made because the FBI was tracking Vince's phone calls. <laughs> so we know that Vince made a call to the doctor's, uh, doctor's house. In October, the trial was set to start, but Otto did not show up in court, claiming that he was sick. The judge dismissed the jurors for the day and sent Dr. Robert Chancey of Beloit to go check on Otto and see if he was fit to stand trial. In fact, Otto was in Mercy Hospital suffering from a cardiac deficiency. He had high blood pressure and a nervous condition. So for the second time now, he couldn't make it to a court date. <laughs> Following this, the judge reversed course and granted Otto's uh, motion to separate the trials from Saro. It wasn't so much based on the previous filing that, he's, that he already denied. It was that, like, I want this to move forward. <laughs> Maybe I should separate this and at least get one of these trials going. <laughs> um, Sarah, who was actually in court, who does show up at court, uh, flared up with anger at this change. He insisted that it was better for him to go on trial with Dr. Otto because he needed the doctor's medical knowledge for his defense. The district attorney also mentioned that Saro might be tied to a second abortion doctor in Milwaukee. This mention in court angered Saro again. And I don't know if he named the doctor in court. I don't know who the doctor is. Following this separation, Saro changed his plea from not guilty to guilty, and he was sentenced to three years in prison for aiding and abetting abortion. Sixteen letters were sent to the judge on his behalf. Three witnesses testified to his good behavior. But the judge was not swayed, and the three-year prison sentence stood. Sarah's just like, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Yeah. He's like, if I'm going to have to go on trial alone, I'm out. I wonder what he thought that the doctor could bring to it that that would have saved him, that he was willing to go to trial with him, but not without him. I don't know. I'm kind of wondering if maybe it's just that with the doctor there, he can kind of point to the doctor as the guy actually doing things. Yeah. Casero didn't do anything other than be bring, like, be bring like, girls to hey, him. Hey, you, you, you want this service? Here's a guy who can provide it, mm -hmm. which is apparently illegal because it's aiding and abetting abortion. But he himself wasn't doing anything. Right, right. And I guess he would get more mercy from the court because the monster that was actually committing the act was in court with him too. I guess. Right. So I think I'm assuming that's how his attorney would have played it. Has been like, no, this is this guy over here's the guy. Like, yeah. Dr. Otto was contacted by the FBI while they were investigating Charlie Vince. Otto declined to talk about Vince and said that he, the doctor, was not engaged in any illegal activity at the present time. Didn't really want to talk to the FBI. He kind of, This is kind of sort of an acknowledgement. He's like, yeah, like I know who Charlie Vince is, but I'm not going to tell you anything about him or why he's been calling me. <laughs> Over a year later, Otto's trial is postponed yet again because he was admitted to the hospital. The judge ordered the trial to begin 24 hours after Otto was released, not a day later. He said, this, you've been in the hospital three times now. <laughs> like, let's just get on with it. He stayed in the hospital for over a month. And finally, February, this was the last thing was in December. February, Otto's case drags on. Now this is the fourth judge that has sat in on it. They've been dragged on so long it's been passed on to different judges, on to the fourth judge. The fourth judge is Richard Orton. 
The case had also been delayed so long that William Donovan, who was previously the district attorney, was no longer even the district attorney anymore, so he was hired on as a special prosecutor. Basically meaning, like, he'd already been preparing this case for so long, we're going to hire you to prosecute it, even though you're not the district attorney. <laughs> so, uh, which, which happens, but it's kind of unusual. Defense attorney Daryl McIntyre filed a motion to dismiss, noting that a recent Supreme Court case said that a criminal warrant must be signed by a magistrate uh, rather than or magistrate rather than a district attorney. Orton denied this motion, pointing out two years' worth of documentation that Otto had repeatedly submitted to the authority of the court, never questioning the legitimacy of the warrant. The warrant was handled properly at the time, and only recently did the Supreme Court change the rules, which was not to be done retroactively. So, uh, technical stuff there. But basically, when the warrant was put out for his arrest, it was signed by the district attorney. The rules had since changed, and the judge now has to sign off on it. But he's like, we followed the rules at the time. I mean, yeah, you can't like, now go back yeah. and say, oh, this is invalid because the law changed three years after. Yeah, it. <laughs> it's <laughs> not our fault you've been dragging this out. <laughs> Furthermore, the judge said, quote, in my judgment, it is ridiculous to grant a continuance when records show the doctor's ability to work and attend social events. The doctor goes to the hospital when the chips are down and then pops out again when the heat is off. <laughs> So blatantly being called out in court for only being sick when he's got trial dates. <laughs> After this, the defense attorney filed a motion asking Judge Orton to disqualify himself, saying that his marks were prejudicial, the things about the doctor basically faking his illnesses. McIntyre said the statement makes the defendant's, defendant's illness a fabrication and causes the defendant to be held in ridicule and contempt in his community and before his peers. The statement is prejudicial to the defendant and is uncalled for, unwarranted, and contrary to the canons of judicial ethics. The motion was denied. McIntyre asked the state's Supreme Court to intervene. They didn't want to. He next asked the federal court, and federal judge James Doyle declined also, saying, this is a state matter. I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> so no, nobody is going to give him, is going to throw this out because the judge is making an offhand remark here. Finally, the case goes to trial. The trial begins. The first witness is one of the women um, who was clearly reluctant to talk. Um, she explained how she had joined Sam Saro and another Madison couple and drove to Beloit. There she underwent a 10-minute examination by Dr. Otto and explained what happened from there. The next day, a man named Ivan Fry testified that his boss, Mr. Marion Roberts, the president of Fomulum Corporation, lent him money so that he could arrange an abortion for a friend of his. So I guess as we're progressing through this story, you see that these are not, obviously, a lot of these are not prostitutes no. per se. They're just regular people. Right. Like so. I said, the ones who actually brought the charges, I don't believe are. Mm -hmm. A divorced woman, um, not identified in the paper. Uh, testified how she met Nicolo Safina, Nick Safina, at Troya's Bar in Madison in August 1962. Safina was then the owner of the Italian Village, which is a restaurant, and the woman was soon hired. Not long after the hiring, Safina and the woman began an ongoing affair, and the woman became pregnant. Safina was married and told the woman an abortion was the only alternative because otherwise he would have to get a divorce. <laughs> The woman agreed, and on the day of the abortion, Safina drove her to Sam Saro's place of business on Willie Street. The woman was upset because she was scared to death of Saro and suspected that something was not safe with this guy. She hoped that Safina, or Safina would, would take her to Beloit. Instead, Saro and another man, not identified, drove her to Beloit, where Dr. Otto gave her a shot in the arm and performed a procedure she described as more painful than childbirth. Wow. She was given two bottles of pills to help with the pain and the bleeding. Despite this experience, she continued to have her affair with Nick Safina for the next several months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's... Uh, 
That's about the most detailed we get, at least that was out in the papers. I suspect a lot of this did not make the papers because they did not want to print some of this. Mm-hmm. But uh, 